minus 30 seconds. T minus 20 seconds. You are now tapped into the coolest reptile podcast in the world. Welcome to Trap Talk Reptile Podcast. This is episode 388, new breed on the block series with my man David Brahms of the Reptile Perch. What is good, everybody? I'm your boy, MJ. Shout out to everyone out there. Appreciate all the love and support. This is your first time tapping into this podcast. Um, do me a favor. Hit that like button, especially if you like what you hear tonight. If you really enjoy it. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that notification bell. Select all. You'll be on top of every single piece of podcast I drop here on YouTube. You can also catch Trap Talk Reptile, Trap Talk Reptile Podcast on all the major audio platforms such as Buzzsprout, Apple Podcasts, Spotify. Please don't forget to rate, review, and uh, subscribe to those platforms as well. But really, thank you for all the love and support. It means a lot, man. If you're looking for exclusive content, if you'd like to support what I do more than what you see here, and if you really want to tap into an awesome com community of Great reptile keepers. Don't look any further than to join the Trap Talk Patreon family. Go down to the very first link you see in the description below. Okay, click on it and then join the pa Patreon family. As soon as you join the Patreon family, you get a link to the Discord, which will tap you in with over 170 trappers. We have an amazing Instagram group uh, chat that goes off every single day. And it's just nothing but just growth. Let's, let's go. I appreciate you so much, my Patreon family. Love you guys. You guys are my heart. Um, big things coming. All right. I will say finally, I was going to tell you guys exclusively on my Patreon members, but guess what? Sunday get togethers are, are normally like, let's kick it on Zoom. They're coming back. That's right. Face to face hangouts are coming back to the Patreon family. I was doing them every Sunday for a while, you know, fuck. And then, you know, obviously life happens, but I'm ready to catch up. I have some plans. So just more exclusive content, more perks when you join the Trap Talk Patreon family. I appreciate all the love and support, man. You guys are my heart. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram. Best thing you do is get your phone and just get your camera out, scan that QR code. That will tap you in with all my other social media platforms, Instagram, um, Trap Talk God 619 on IG, and you can follow the podcast's Instagram page as well. And then also don't forget to head over to my other YouTube channel, The Trap Vlogs, where each week on Fridays, every single Friday, I am not missing. Been, been consistent, I think four in a row. Okay, my goal is to do Fridays and then do another day. Okay, so encourage me by going to that YouTube channel, subscribe to it. All right, because I want to keep that going. My biggest thing right now, guys, is showing you what's happening behind me, in front of me, on the side. The, this is my biggest passion. No, no disrespect to the podcast world, but fuck that. I want to be legendary in this before anything else. So that channel, you can see everything that's happening with my animals. Very transparent. And I tried to help you guys out. You know, I, I share a lot of my experiences with you guys uh, because, you know, best way to do it, man. Experience is the best teacher. So thank you for all the love and support. Shout out to people in the early birds. I'll get to you guys in a minute. Support U.S. Ark, please. The fight never stops. And U.S. Ark is here to help us fight for our damn animal rights. Make sure our animals are good, our reptiles, my livelihood, my my everything, my, my therapeutic uh, zen. U.S. ARC is amazing at what they do, but seriously, guys, we need to be the ones to support them as much as they support us. Go down to the link below, click on it. If you have no idea what U.S. ARC even stands for, go read up on it, especially if you're a reptile keeper, and you'll see the importance of becoming a U.S. ARC member. Stay alert, be ready. You never know when it's going to hit you. Uh, but thank you, Phil Goss. Thank you, the entire U.S. ARC team. Do you want to say that tonight's episode is brought to you by... My boy, Gary Shavino over at GS Reptiles. Head over to YouTube. We're well, already here now, but type in GS, GS Reptiles. Subscribe to this man's YouTube channel and be ready to learn and have a good time with my man, Gary. One of the sickest, coolest individuals in the reptile industry. He's one of my good friends, and I learn a lot from the guy. A lot of us do. Thank you, Gary. Appreciate your love and support. 
Um, I also want to say that tonight's episode is brought to you by Freedom Breeder. Please head over to Freedom Breeder Instagram, head over to their website. And if you feel like you're at that level, you're ready to take shit to that next level of the professionalism of breeding or keeping Freedom Breeder stainless steel racks number one in the game since the 90s. Thank you so much, Jesse, and the entire Freedom Breeder crew. You guys are amazing. Much love and support. I also want to say that tonight's episode is brought to you by my boy, Mark Bailey, over at Mark Bailey Reptiles. Head over to his Morph Market and be ready because this guy is producing nonstop amazing ball python productions. Probably one of the most relevant people in the ball python game, in my own opinion. He's a goat, man. Shout out to Mark Bailey and Mark Bailey Reptiles. I also want to say, guys, head over to my Morph Market. Speaking of Mark Bailey. Head over to my Morph Market. Follow the Trap Exotics on Morph Market. Um, I have yet to put a lot of stuff that's established and ready to go. A lot of amazing 100% double head DG Clown stuff. Um, so be ready for that. The Trap Exotics on Morph Market. Anything you see available now, man, hit me up. Don't be shy. But a lot of that shit is Mark Bailey production, man. Super top quality heat. And yeah. Thank you so much to all the sponsors. You guys are you guys are my heart. I appreciate it so much. But early birds, who's ready to rock and roll? Guess what? Texas, he is not yours. Dude, I don't know if it was Bill Stegall. I don't know who tried claiming this guy out of Texas. He's not from Texas. So tonight, Texas, calm down in the chats, all right? It's crazy. Dude, shout out to my guy, Peter, all right, over in the Netherlands. For whatever reason, this podcast was scheduled at noon today. I don't I don't remember ever doing that. So he was really excited because noon is about 9 o'clock his time. But unfortunately, this guy's Mimi time right now because it's probably 3, 4 a.m. Where, where he's at. But Peter, maybe someday I'll get you that 12 in the afternoon podcast. I promise. Shout out to all my European trappers out there. You guys are my heart. Um, by the way, Trap Talk Patreon member all day, every day. Noble Family Geckos in the building. Trap Talk Patreon member all day ready. Thanks for tapping in. Victory Lane Exotics. What is good? Big Mike, 1776 Exotics. Trap Talk Patreon member, the OG. Appreciate you. Row 5.0 all day, every day. Trap Talk Patreon member all day, every day. Brooke, born in the building. Trap Talk Patreon member all day, every day. Thank you for tapping in. The homie Robert from Orange County Condros in the building. Trap Talk Patreon member all day, every day. The homie Brian from Heath and Hatchery just posted some amazing Cypress hypos. In the Patreon. I don't know if he did that publicly yet. Man, this guy's Cypress game is no joke. Don't sleep on my man. Brian, Keith and Hatchery. Trap Talk Patreon. That's my dog. Jordan. Guys, check it out. Heartland Reptiles. Not to be slept on. Be ready. This guy has some sick-ass shit that he's coming out with. And uh, yes, Trap Talk Patreon member. Jordan's making big groundbreaking things in the hobby. Be ready. Remember the name. That's my dog. NW Herpetological. <laughs> I've had to say that a long time. Thanks for tapping in, bro. I appreciate you. Trap Talk Patreon member all day every day. Miller's Menagerie in the building. Trap Talk Patreon member all day every day. Mark Curry from Mark Curry Reptiles. Trap Talk Patreon member all day every day. Ricky Bobby SRT, the homie Shane from Above All Scales. What is good? Trap Talk Patreon member all day every day. Tyler Willis in the building. What is up? The homie, me I almost called you Miguel. Angel from Reptile Club 310. Barbecuing, having a brew right now. LA style, what is good? <laughs> I love that guy. Patreon member all day every day. Trap talk, my boy. Thank you so much. The homie Diego in the building, my right hand in the in 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 the house. Trap talk, Patreon member all day every day. Appreciate you so much. Lord Bear Exotics in the building. What is up, player? I don't have any arboreals, but really want wanting my boss to get something soon. Yeah, tell your boss to step his shit up, bro. If he's ready for that. Not for everyone. We'll talk about it tonight. Green tree pythons are amazing. Or you said arboreal, so maybe you're not talking green tree pythons. We'll talk about it. Appreciate you. Uh, Julio Fooley on the building. Trap Talk. Patreon member all day, every day. <laughs> North Star Exotics in the building. What is up? The homie Man Freddy in the building. Trap Talk. Patreon member all day, every day. Appreciate you so much. Uh, Randy. I think you told me how to say your last name. Peguis. Oh, man. Either way, it's the homie right here. Randy, uh, who basically broke. Uh, the floods gates open for Amazon tree boa content coming to the trap. Uh, appreciate you, Randy, so much. Static exotics, I think that's st I probably fucked that up too. Either way, catch our episode. It was last week. It was great. Uh, Bluesin, Bluesin, Blazing Blue Tongues. What is wrong with me today? Blazing Blue Tongues in the building. What is up? 361 Exotics. What is good? Antonio Gonzalez. What is up? Thanks for tapping in. Uh, let's see. Carry on. 
0313, what is good? They should tap it in. Bradley in the building, what is good? They should tap it in. Exotics Keeper Vision in the building, what is good? The homie Aiden Burke in the building. We're going to end it in style with the homie AB, Aiden Burke. But guys, I think it's time to get this new breed on the block series. Ready to rock and roll because, like I said, super stoked. Long overdue. Been wanting to talk to this guy, my man, Dave Brahms, for a while from the Reptile Perch. First and foremost, head over to the Reptile Perch on Instagram. Follow his work. His work right behind me. Probably busted out at some point tonight. But all these perches right here and all my hatching rack designed by my man, David Brahms. PVC built design. This guy's been doing it. So be ready because tonight's episode is going to be one for the books. And I hope you're ready right now because it's time to get going. Do what you got to do to get your mind right. Do what you got to do to stay hydrated. Episode 388 coming at you right now. The Reptile Perch. Let's go. Cheers. Ready for do do more in the future? Trap yes. talk podcasts? Yes. Man. Only, only trap talk. Exclusive. Yes. Trap Exclusive. Exclusive. <laughs> oh. So stop calling us. <laughs> <laughs> From the spot, get the club to pop. When I come up with the crop, I love it, love it, and not I'm hot from the hop to the club to spot. Get the club to pop. When I come up with the club to spot, get the club to pop. When I come up with the club to spot, get the club to pop. When I come up with the club to spot, get the club to pop. When I come up with the everybody. Live with David Brahms. What's up, David? Hey, MJ. What's going on? You like Dave or David? I, I probably should have asked you before. Hey, one's fine. Dave's good. What's up, Dave? We got we, <laughs> connections great now, huh, buddy? But damn yeah. it, location what? sucks, but connections good. First thing I said was because you know he has a stack of Cambro tubs that look crystal clear, and I was like, man, those are really awesome. And then sure enough, I jinxed it by saying that because then the connection went bad. But whatever, man. We're we're here, and it's all good. We're. Yep. Uh, we're going to pull up your stuff on your social media so people know if they don't know what kind of heat you're packing. But man, my man, David Brahms from the Reptile Perch, recently like rebranded or new, like newly branded, I want to say, because you've never had a logo or anything like that before, correct? Yeah. Yeah. I've been doing this since uh, 2016, originally as specialty enclosure designs. That's and, what it was. Uh, Oh, gee, I took some advice. I, I want to double down on what you're saying about Gary Scavino uh, earlier. That man's the dude. Uh, yeah, he he's is. been nothing but super supportive uh, for me, and and has bent over backwards to really help promote my stuff. And I can't be more grateful for him. He's a, he's a really good dude. And look, he's here. And and listen, I, and here Gary's gonna go here. I'm just gonna give give me shit. Yeah, you're right. I'm gonna give you shit, Gary, because I've not seen him in I've not seen him in the live chats in quite a long time. And you know, listen, he's became a huge Taylor Swift fan over the last few months. I and know. he is a, he's just a busy guy, and I get it. On top of putting out amazing YouTube content, um, I, I get it, man. And I'm just happy he's here. But honestly, real recognized, real because I've always knew of you, but when. I saw Gary give you a shout on his YouTube channel yep. and then also being at his place. He showed me all your purchases, and I was like, yeah. dude, I need these. Like I need these. Um, and, and you know, why don't we kind of get into the first topic of you designing these PVC purchases that are not only affordable, um, probably one of the cleanest purchases that you can get as far as having to sanitize and whatnot, mm -hmm. but just actually good for the snake. And, and I want to know, where that idea even sparked from um, and where you already kind of heavy in keeping chondros. And then it came the idea of that, that type of stuff. Let's get right into that. Sure. Yeah. Um, so again, it goes back to Gary. He reached out to me a few years back and cause he was doing a new uh, rebuild or, or a new build uh, for his collection. And right. he needed perching for all those new cages that he was getting. And uh, I, before that was not dabbling in the PVC stuff at all. 
Uh, I was mainly making tub perches and things like that. Um, so when I, I started looking into it, I didn't really want to go down the road of, of scorching and burning the PVC for obvious reasons. I just don't want to have to deal with that on a regular basis. And uh, I just did some research and testing and found that I can uh, stain the PVC uh, with a special process that creates a permanent bond to the PVC mm. that's safe and, and uh, you know, works really well. Uh, and I was able to play around with, you know, the coloring and, and that sort of stuff to make them look more natural. Uh, and everything just kind of fell in place, been hitting the road ever since. Yeah, because I want to say the, um, what was it? It was the color, the, 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 the brown shade, the coloration that I went with. Yep. That's more of a newer tone right like that wasn't something you first came out with right like well it, these develop kind of like artwork it's different every time i go and do it um, right okay, it's not you. super precise so there is some variation run to run when i do this which is good right um you know not everything's going to come out looking exactly the same sometimes darker sometimes lighter you know that sort of thing so you know for the most part when people place an order with you, Dave, um, are measurements something that you, they need to do on their own regardless? Like they can't really go with uh, something that they feel like is a standard measurement. Like I'm just trying to get people prepared to what they should do before they reach out to you and yeah. want to get some work done. I, I get some people that request a very specific measurement. I What I tend to do is ship everything just a little bit longer than what their cage is going to need, and then they'll make a final trim cut. I mean, they're just PVC pipes, so they're super easy to cut. And that just ensures that I, I would hate to make somebody a big order and ship it to them and then find out afterwards <laughs> that they measured incorrectly wow. and everything's too short. Um, so what I do is I send it with an extra inch or two, and then they'll take a measurement, and they'll make a trim cut in order for things to fit properly. That's my preferred way to do it. Right. Um, but I do, you know, if someone's really confident as to exactly what size the perch needs to be, I do that as well. Man, I was, and you know, David's customer service, even though, I mean, I, I would consider us like, you know, we're, 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 we're pals, you know what yeah. I mean? So I think you're doing me a solid, but man, I told David, David, I'm like, I'm like a goddamn fucking, um, <laughs> Tim, the Toolman Taylor, you know what I mean? Like I'm either going to fuck it up or I'm going to get hurt or both. Um, <laughs> But regardless, I figured out, got the correct measurements. Yeah. Um, and, and and man, do they just, we want to just want to talk about just something that is so just relaxing is when there's something you need to do in that enclosure, which is a lot of the times, right? Yeah. Um, most people have stuff customly fit in their cages where they can't pull it out so smoothly. And I, I just came from that. Like, that's all I had. Like I had stuff where I'm knocking over water bowls, like, like probably shaking them off. Like it was, it was to the point where I hated going in there to mess with them. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. But now it's like nothing. Like it's it's as simple as going in there, pulling them off, setting and putting them right back. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. Now I, I'm curious about sizing to you because one thing that was dropped here on this podcast was the idea as far as having a perch go directly across, right? Yeah. Um, now – what about size? I want, I'm curious how you look at size as far as the appropriate size of perch for a chondro. Cause, cause chondros is all you keep or do you, do you dabble in other stuff too? Correct. Yeah. Me. It's almost entirely chondros. I have a couple, you know, other animals too, but nothing that I'm breeding or anything like that. I'm so trying chondros. to keep okay. chondros. Yep. Okay. So let's, let's talk about like what your theory is or, or what your, um, what is it that you feel is a good, idea size for an adult chondro and even for the babies as well yeah so i think this is a, a topic that people like to debate a lot there's a lot of opinions but if you anytime you are able to find pictures of wild chondros or even emerald tree boas and things like that they're not sitting on big fat branches they're usually on twig like material way out on the end of the branch so that you know, a predator can't easily get to them and snatch them up while they're sleeping during the day. Right. And so uh, really, you want to keep things relatively small, smaller than you might think is appropriate for these animals. But that's what they tend to prefer. Um, people, you know, a lot of people have experienced the, the whole, um, you know, the cord running to your heat panel. That will yeah. oftentimes become the preferred perch for the animal in the enclosure because 100%. it's the highest spot and it's also the thinnest branch. 
Mm-hmm. So that's what they're looking for is something thin and uh, high up is generally where they want to go. Uh, so whenever anybody asks me, I, you know, I, I want to see, you know, how big is the animal that they're dealing with? And if it's an adult, generally speaking, I like to keep all my adults on half inch PVC. They, they're perfectly content with that. And I give them multiple options uh, height wise where they want to go. Uh, I also like to include, you know, branch extensions and things like that onto the perches to give them some additional options where it'll be even thinner. And it'll also uh, give them the chance to perch on something that's uh, like a cross brace. So they don't have to have that traditional chondro perch, you know, wrap. They can actually, you know, spread and span across a couple intersections and get more comfortable. Yeah, you know, because one of the things that does make a lot of sense is if there's a perch, like let's just say you have the highest perch only like on the basking side of the enclosure and there's maybe not a perch on that same height on the cooler side, it will go yeah. to that big, it'll go to that higher side regardless if it wants it to eat or not, just because it feels like it's safer. Right? Yeah. Um, it's all about yeah. security. Yep. Yeah. And, 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 you know, obviously noticing that like this one right here would always in a sense be under the, uh, be the under panel. The, uh, the the panel but i had the perch going all the way like diagonally in the corner so yeah. now now if you notice it's all yeah. the way on the opposite side it's and, and and you know obviously unless it it just ate a meal it's on that side all the time yep. If it yep. that side. um you know and that's the stuff to pay attention to i didn't you know i've been keeping chondros not too too long but holy shit like never thought of the idea of like yeah give them a higher perch but make sure they have a cool side up top and a warmer side though you know they just need options and it doesn't hurt to have options right yeah uh, so you know always always just you know it's funny how the lights turn on sometimes when you're just like why well, didn't i not see this before but so i'm thankful that's to have I, a pot that's why i'm thankful to have a podcast dave <laughs> yeah exactly that's the, that's what the cool thing is about chondros anyway we don't know everything about them you know every year yeah. we're learning new stuff and you know the whole husbandry you know protocols have really changed quite a bit in the last 10 years or so um you know yeah. people are keeping them a lot cooler now they're giving them better perching options um everything is evolving it always will yeah and so 2016 is when you kind of first stumbled across the chondro community or the chondro game correct or no 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 i started getting into chondros back in 2012 and okay. started building my collection then uh and then i started producing them uh in 2019 nice oh wow so 2012 and and, and mind you who who'd you inquire in the, in the beginning like who are the first people you purchased snakes from yep um so gary was one of my first purchases i got a prada line uh manaquari uh cross from him respect. and then uh rico walder before he passed away was another one that wow, i got uh, an animal from and then the the rest of my collection a lot of it came from bushmaster as as neonates wow yep that's some powerful lineage right Le- lineages right there to be honest yep. um yep. Now the Rico Wilder was it just something you inquired online? Like, did he have it um, a bait, or was it in person? Like, how'd you get your hands on that? Yeah, I, I worked off his website. You know, he had some animals available on there, and I actually think that animal that I snagged from him was a collaboration between him and Gary because it was another Prada uh, lineage animal uh, crossed with Vinsky, uh, and then the one that I got from Gary was a Prada Manaquari crossed with a Cyclops, um, and. Uh, that's what uh, one of the uh, the uh, clutches that I produced this year. It's the third time in a row for that pairing. Uh, so I'm curious, you know, 2012 is when you first started kind of getting your feet wet, but you waited seven years to pair. Um, and, and that was just because that's how long you felt your feet, you know, you felt comfortable doing it or, or, or what? Yeah, I wasn't really in a rush, to be honest with you. I was just taking my time, raising them slowly, building the collection. Uh, and I had animals in all different stages in terms of age. Uh, by the time 2019 rolled around, um, that was the first year where I, you know, I felt like everybody was big enough and old enough and started uh, doing introductions. Wow. I, you know, I, dude, I remember seeing this snake when I very first started following you. And, I, and, and I'm just I'm predicting this is a snake that's been in your collection for a while. Yeah, I grabbed her right around that 2000, uh, I might have been around 2014 or 15, I think, as a baby. And is this like a hormonal type blue that she goes into, or does she look, look like this all the time? Yeah, she's not hormonal. She's she's blue. Um, I bought her as an unchanged red Manaquari baby, 
And, wow. uh, you know, she developed a lot of melanism at first and a lot of that has gone away, but, uh, as the melanism goes, the blue comes in and she's been getting bluer every year. I got to ask you, Dave, at what point do you like to put them in a rain chamber? Like when do you feel like you need to, when this step is necessary here? Yeah. So that all kind of works into the way I like to, uh, breed these guys. Uh, so I, I like doing food cycling quite a bit and, um, when you're hitting the females heavy with food, it's important to make sure that they're, they're emptying out, uh, on a regular basis. Okay. And, um, you know, when the cycling begins, I'm hitting them really heavy with food and I'll introduce them into a rain chamber, you know, every couple of weeks to make sure they clear out and I can continue the feed cycling, uh, pretty heavy. Jeez. That's pretty much how I do it. <sighs> I love it. Um, and, and let me ask you, what's the importance you feel like of making sure that they're having the regular bowel movements? Like, do you feel like um, that's crucial to having a healthy clutch or getting them to go period? Or what's the big reason behind that? Yeah, it's more of, I, I just want to maintain their health throughout the whole breeding process. And it's not natural for them to be backed up like that. That's definitely a condition of captivity. You know, in the wild, they're they're climbing up and down trees every day, going down to ground level to hunt and breeding and things like that. And they don't carry a lot of waste all the time. And uh, so what I try to do is just make sure that they're maintaining a good body weight and they're not backed up so that they don't develop a prolapse or mm. it somehow gets in the way of the breeding process or anything like that. It's just a matter of uh, making sure they're cleaned out and good to go all the time. Yeah. Yeah, you know, because you also have, and and and, I, and obviously this is people who mainly you're just getting into it. They just maybe think, oh wow, my snake hasn't shit in a long time. Like, you know, what to do? Well, you know, this is kind of steps that we can do, and this is actually I feel too beneficial. Is if you could get this thing to be, you know, empty stomach and get it on its next meal. Yep. Because imagine you, person, like, you know, you, you want to be constipated all the time. Right. Like, <laughs> yeah, you don't want to do much of anything when you're constipated. So. And what's crazy is you'll notice how it's not long that they're getting rained on until they shit. You know, like, they yeah. they shit within a couple minutes for the most part. Um, especially yep. emeralds, you know, because I do that pretty, like, I don't know. I, after talking to Warren, Warren's like, fuck, I'll go with, like, three meals or something. With that. And, and I get that, but I, I want to make sure at least approaching – like two meals, I think is fine, but approaching that third meal, like yeah. I want to make sure that that because the size of the urates, you know, the urates are fucking like monster, and it's yeah. like at some point, when is that going to become blockage? You know what I mean? Yeah. So it can certainly happen. Yeah, and and, and um, and so yeah, I, I definitely notice, and I, I got to mind you, like my condors, I feel like knock on wood, I mean, I, they shit pretty regularly. Like I, yeah. I, I feed them every two three weeks, and it's like within a five to a, five days to a week they have already taken their shit you know what i yeah. mean yeah so so i i feel like that's not really a concern for me now i'm not even talking breeder females i feel like when it comes to you you know like spiking up the food and stuff like that well then i feel like this is when i should consider doing this you know what i mean because yeah it's another tool in the arsenal you know uh, right. i think most people don't do it but i find that it works really well for me um you know when i'm doing feed cycling i'm hitting the the girls pretty heavy um, mm -hmm. and you know, I, a while back, I plotted some data, uh, that Rico had collected on how much he was pounding, uh, a specific female that he was breeding right. and he was charting the follicle growth along with the feed rate. And he was putting a lot of food to that female. And you can see there's a direct correlation to, uh, when they start that power feeding cycle, the follicles start to develop and they, they, you know, were able to, to go through a full breeding cycle as a result of that. And for me, the rain chamber just allows me to, to continue that process relatively seamlessly. I can continue really heavy feedings. And I'm talking a couple times a week, small meals right. until, you know, I finally reach that point where they're off feed and they'll eventually ovulate. And the rain chamber is just, I find it to be a really convenient tool. Uh, not to mention the fact that most of the females, when I put them in there, um, yeah, they'll go to the bathroom probably within about 15 minutes or so. Generally, uh, I'll add this. If they're in a shed cycle, they're not going to go. Uh, so don't even bother wait until they're done with a shed cycle. And if they still haven't gone, you know, you can do a rain chamber. Um, yeah. but the other real benefit that I find is that, um, the rain is definitely a stimulus for them. That's where they get a lot of their water in the wild. You know, they'll drink from their coils or, you know, uh, bromeliads or things like that. 
And uh, they do that, you know, uh, quite extensively when I put them in there. You know, they'll bre- uh, they'll drink for an extremely long time. Uh, even though I'm providing fresh water on a regular basis and, and all that stuff, they just, you know, it's a preferred way for them to drink, I think. Dave, I don't know if you know this, but I get pretty annoying about giving your animal. I tell people they should begin giving their fucking snakes fresh water. And it does it does kind of aggravates me when I'm being Mr. Fucking front man on this fresh water thing. And I notice that I have this fresh water inches away from this snake and it's chugging water when I'm spraying it. And I'm like, yeah. bro, you're not drinking it's here like yeah and, and some of them i admit it's just, and, and mind you it's a lot of them that are paired up that do this like yep. some of them i don't think they're i don't think they're really thinking like that i think they're just like rain's a pretty. stimulant you know yeah. they, they're used to being rained on they 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 come from yeah. extraordinarily wet areas year round and that is a stimulate it, it stimulates them to, to drink to go to the bathroom and all kinds of things and and that's something that uh you know i think as things evolve more um we'll probably start looking, you know, back at, Hey, what are we doing in terms of, you know, providing them with the right kind of water source and, and stimulation? Uh, I think people really shied away from that because they thought they were going to give their animals an RI by spraying their animals. So, you know, a lot of people really avoid that, but I think now that we have a better understanding as to what's going on there with NIDO and, and those sorts of things, I bet, you know, you could probably come up with a pretty good protocol to be able to do regular uh, mistings or waterings via a rain method right. in their enclosure. Um, and then, you know, it, it'd be beneficial for them. You know, it's just something that I think would be worth exploring down the road. I recommend this to anybody if you're not already, but if you follow somebody out there who's doing something that you want to be successful at, like for instance, we're talking green tree pythons. Hello, right? Be very like, like note taking, like pay close attention to what works for people and be mindful of it. Right. But we're going to jump gears as far as what species we're talking about, because mind you, we're talking about the king of basins, man, my man, Ed Marino shout to Ed Marino. Um, but I'm noticing what he does. And I know this is so important because I've had buddies who just had heartbreaking experiences with their basins, like either dying, trying to give birth or dying, giving birth or dying after the birth. But there's something that's happening to these basins. Right. But why is this guy always putting this female in a rain chamber and she drops the litter in the rain chamber? Mm-hmm. Like he's spraying. He I'm, I'm realizing that he's spraying in a rain chamber type environment for this snake that's about to give birth. Because I feel like a lot of these snakes aren't drinking. They're not getting what they need because of some sort of like shutdown in their head or they're like, maybe just like, I don't know what's happening and I can't move. And like, they, like you physically had to give them a drink. I don't know if you follow somebody named Christopher Rice. I just Mm -hmm. had him on the show. Yeah. This this guy. and, And mind you, I'm like, man, you know, don't, you know, don't always just do what people do, but he'll get a fucking cup of water and put it straight to the emerald's mouth. And the emerald will just start drinking it. You know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. So it, it's like, like this whole rain chamber stuff and and doing a little bit more to provide hydration. I feel like is a crucial part to everything that we're doing right now. I think. Yeah, I think one of the the symptoms of us keeping these in captivity dry is where uh, the animals are more sedentary and. Yeah they won't roam around a lot if things are dry that's how they act in the wild during the dry season animals aren't moving they're a lot harder to find uh come the rainy season things get active and they move around and uh i think you know one of the theories for why are they doing these specific things when they're getting rained on like giving birth or going to the bathroom or those kind of things one of the thoughts is that well if they're doing that during a a rainstorm uh your scent signature is not as great and you're not going to potentially give away your location to a predator that's going to want to come and eat those babies that were just born. Or, yeah. you know, if you went to the bathroom, that's also going to give you location away. So that's just another theory that, you know, they're they're cued into that whole rain cycle and they do biological activities around that. And that's something that we don't really do in captivity very much at all. Yeah. And, and, and you know, because, you know, I feel like... <laughs> Like, I know it's like, damn, an extra step on top of everything else does sound like a pain in the ass. But if it's that step that matters, and and mind you, I think every step should matter, right? But, I mean, there's a reason why people deal with so much heartbreak, you know what I mean? Because there are maybe just small things that we're not really seeing and not applying that could maybe prevent us from us even having to go through this, you know what I mean? 
Sure. Um, so I just, and I didn't really know, you know, I've been following Ed since I first came into this. And I never noticed that he puts the female and, and, and I got to talk to him more about it. I don't know if it's every single female, but fuck, I noticed the last couple females that he showed pictures of were in a rain chamber. You know what I mean? Yep. And, yep. And, I, and I can only assume he knows when this female's about to drop and he puts her in there during that time. Yep. And, and I know because I see the nozzles everywhere. I see the goddamn little like it's so sick. I love it. Like yeah. I love that he has that. And, and, and you know, I have I have one extra excuse me. I have one open three by two by two focus cube habitat. And I'm like, man, I should just maybe turn that shit into a rain chamber because, yeah. and because mind you, like the, the simplicity of putting into there, because here's another thing, Dave, we're talking about putting something in a rain chamber type setting, but you got to have that water pressure up. I feel like not obviously too high, but it can't be no little fucking spray bottle with your hand. Like no, it, it, it doesn't, doesn't work pressure. that way. It needs yeah. pressure. I, I use a, a water reservoir and a uh, mist King, pump system uh to be able to do that so i can turn it on and walk away and let them get rained on for an hour or two with with no interruptions i originally uh was turned on to that by uh, steve volk he's That's another amazing. big time emerald breeder and, and yeah. he's a big advocate of the rain chambers and mm -hmm. when I saw what he was doing with the emeralds, you know, that stuff's directly applicable to green trees. And so I started incorporating that into my husbandry too. And uh, yeah. it's worked well for me. Since we're on this topic of like things we're doing to kind of up the ante for a female and breeding or whatever, as far as making sure they're on the right road. Um, what's your idea as far as, uh, oh man, my might hold on. Shit. Damn it. Hold on. It'll come. I'll, I'll <laughs> This happens at least once an episode um okay we're talking about rain chambers females damn now i'm overthinking it oh well but i will say though um oh, man damn it now i'm pissed oh well what are you gonna do <laughs> are you noticing are you noticing though that like okay, let me ask you this, Dave. Is is the rain chamber something a part of every single snake? Like, if a snake's in shed, does it go to the rain chamber? Like, is it that that type of thing for you? No, no. The only time they're going to go to the rain chamber is if they're not in a shed cycle. And I've had multiple feedings, and they haven't gone uh, in a while. And specifically, if it's the breeding season, I'm hitting them heavy with food. I know how much I've put into them, and and they need to go before I start cranking them up some more um and it's only the females i never bother putting the males in there they they go very regularly uh and haven't needed it but the females are the ones that tend to hold on so i and this isn't what i was thinking of i, I think that thought is long gone but i did think of something else that i want to talk to you about that yeah. always stands out to me because listen do your thing right do what works for you and rico wilder man last time i checked he did not feed anything or none of his chondros rats only mice right is that am i right yeah, I believe so. Yeah. Okay. I know he's done both. I know. I know he's tried rats, and then he's like kind of. I think I remember I was talking to um, uh, Buddy. Shout out to Buddy Bushimi. But I was talking yeah. to Buddy, and, and Buddy was like, "Yeah, you know, I knew that he was on rats at one point. He used to do heavier, and then he went. Then he went to mice. And mind you, these meals that are more frequently fed to these chondros of female while she while they're grabbing." are being fed something that is extremely not extremely but a, quite a bit of less fat and less size than an actual rat or if we're talking to jumbo mice right um yeah. it, it, was that your thing as well too are you feeding just mice to your chondros or, or i am but i'm i'm not opposed to feeding rats whatsoever uh i think all that came down to people being ultra paranoid about prolapses and, you know, frankly, prolapses in adult uh, chondros is relatively rare. Uh, it's been my experience. I have yet to have one, knock on wood, an adult that prolapses. It's yeah. always the neonates, the fresh mm -hmm. patches that, uh, that have issues. Um, and rats are their natural prey in the wild. They're not eating mice. They're eating rats. Mm. Um, so I, I don't have any issue uh, doing that. I just, you know, it's habit. I just haven't bothered to do it. They're doing fine on, on adult mice, and that's just what I've been doing. Wow. So, I, I mean, and, and from the get go, it's always been mice for you. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, and, and the males, do you feed them what, like what, once a month? Yeah, roughly. Yeah. Whenever they need it, basically. Yeah. I just, you know, it's more, I, 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 I eyeball them to see what their body weight's looking like. And, 
if it looks like they're starting to get a little too thin for the way I like them to be, I'll, I'll give them a few extra meals or whatever, but generally they get fed very sparse. So you're already at the point where you're producing snakes from your own productions, right? Like, like yep. you're like, okay. Um, when do you feel like is a good time to breed a male and female for the first time? Yeah. Um, so females, anytime after four years old, uh, it works fine. Five years would be preferred, but uh, I've done it at four, no problem whatsoever. I know a lot of people are really um, paranoid about the size of the female and if she can handle laying a clutch. Um, there's plenty of data out there that Daniel Natouche and those folks have collected out in the field showing that you know reproductive females can be quite small. And I've personally bred uh, a female without issue. I think she's probably right around 600 grams, if I were to guess. Um, and I got a perfectly healthy clutch. I think it was like uh, a baker's dozen, 13 eggs, and they're all normal size, no issues whatsoever. Um, wow. They're fully capable of passing those eggs at, at a small size. As long as you keep them hydrated and, and are doing everything else that you're supposed to be doing, they should be fine. Yeah. And, you know, just like humans, different sizes, right? We all come yep. in different shapes and sizes and uh, a lot of people don't really, that's why I always feel like age is always your best bet, you know, go yep. with the age. And obviously if the snake's eating and drinking and doing everything accordingly, then go for it. You know, right. like yep. ain't, ain't nothing wrong with that. Um, now, you know, my thing with males, I don't know, like, I feel like, um, obviously they say slim, like slimmer, the better or whatever, but I, yep. I just, I know that males could really get on one and meaning like they could just only want to breed and not want anything to do with food. And that kind of worries me sometimes. Yeah. Even if you have a guy who's like, like, Oh, he looks good. But like, I feel like I don't want my males to go in pretty like ready to rock and roll, like pretty not thick and fucking overweight, but we're talking like, like athletic looking, like, you know what I mean? Yeah. But basically, still eat, basically still eating. Um, yeah, and, and one one thing that one of my good buddies in the ball python game who's he does really well, my boy Will Moros, um, he likes to feed his males, especially like the males that are going to like seven different females. It's a thing in the ball python game, right? Sure. Um, so every like four or five days, he'll feed his male something very small, yeah, uh, not tiny, but like you know we're talking like a rat pup to a nine hundred gram snake. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, do you feel like that could maybe help with certain? Like, like you know, obviously the males less is more, but if you could get smaller meals within a male that's breeding a lot, do you think that could be beneficial? I think you just want to maintain their body weight. So as long as they're not dropping a lot of weight, I wouldn't be pumping them full of food during the pre the breeding process. Right. Um, it, it's really that. As long as they're maintaining body weight, they're good to go. And generally speaking, my experience has been a, a lean male is a good breeder. Mm -hmm. and um you know a healthy male is a good breeder you just don't want anybody chunky if they're obese they're just gonna you know it causes a lot of issues and they're gonna be less motivated generally yeah i mean a period they won't breed they'll just sit yeah. there <laughs> luckily for me all of my males feed during the whole breeding season if i need yeah. them to i've yet to have one where they're you know they just go off food forever i know some people have that it's quite common um but you know uh they will, you know, shut off for a really long extended period of time uh, during the breeding process. And, and some males can really get dangerously low in weight uh, during that. So it's something yeah. to keep an eye, an eye on. Are we talking like medium, small mice to the males while they're, while they're uh, breeding no. or how, how big or just regular adult mice? Yeah, I'll feed them a large mouse. Okay. Yeah. But it's very infrequent, you know, like maybe once a month during the breeding cycle. Right. The males, I don't really worry too much. It's the females that are, I'm pumping them full of food. I'm on the fence about a certain pair right now because I have a Vinsky Biak designer. My very first designer uh, Condor I ever got, which I thought was a female, turned out to be a male. But I have him paired up to my Monocory. Haven't seen mon much action, I'm not going to lie. Um, but I do know that other, other stuff that I've had paired up almost all year are now starting to do stuff. Like they're it's yeah. starting to see action. So I don't know. I'm like, man, is this going to happen with them or should I pull them and, and, and give so, another homie a shot who's been roaming around? Looks like he's ready to rock and roll. But for you, like, how do you like to look at a pair? Like, like once they're paired up, are you like, I'm leaving this alone until it goes a distance? Or are you like, hmm, I'm not seeing what I should be seeing. Let me move this male around or, 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 or how do you delegate that? I'm curious. 
Yeah. So generally, it it seems as though there there are some compatibility issues with some males and the females. Um, for whatever reason, you can't get some pairs to take. They just have no interest in each other, and who knows why. Um, mm. But you know, if you've got a pair that you're targeting, what I do is is if the time of year is right and I introduce them, if I've done everything right, they're going to lock up almost immediately. Right. Um, and if they don't, I'll give them a day or two. And if nothing happens, I separate. And typically what happens though, is they'll lock up and you'll see some heavy activity for a day or two. And then they'll kind of get tired of each other and move to separate areas of the enclosure. And I'll separate them at that point. Uh, for a few days and then I'll reintroduce them again uh, after that and it's like they haven't seen each other in forever and they lock back up again so it's just that's what I do during the the breeding season is I take advantage of those introductions and separations so that uh, I can feed the females uh, you know heavily and um, you know and then I'll reintroduce the male you know within a day or two after a feeding and uh, and if there's activity I let them be and the moment they separate and they're not interested, I'll go ahead and I'll remove the male again and, and let them calm down for a few days. And I just, I repeat that cycle over and over again. Yeah. I, I just like everything else I overthink certain things and I go, God damn it. Like something's telling me not to pull this male right now, leave it. And, 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 you know, I think right now I have good reason to feel like this because this pair right here, or right. That pair right there. Um, they, they, you know, nothing but action for like the last couple weeks. Like this yep. guy, he's been all over, right? And she just refused. Like she, and she's somebody, Perfect. she doesn't refuse at all. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um. So I'm, and he's still all over. So I'm like, I'm going to leave that be. I'm just going to let yep. that do, because there's no reason to feed or anything. Or, like this, she's refusing. So right. Um, I'll leave that be. Now the one of right above it, that's the one, that's my Vinsky and Monocory, right? Um, mm -hmm. And I go in and they're just always next to each other. Like always hanging out. And, and it's been probably two months since I saw a lock on it. I saw like something happen where they fooled around. Oh, I know what it was. When I, I don't know if you heard me say this before, Dave, but I just moved into this house earlier this year in January. Mm -hmm. And so when I first moved in, it was already winter time ish. So, you know, I was only just working with the ambient here in San Diego, as far as weather goes. Yep. And that means that this room was mercy to whatever it was outside. Right. Yep. So as it got warmer, this room got warmer like more warmer than i wanted it to and then i got my my mini split finally installed and then all of a sudden when i had this room controlled at a certain temps that's when everything started locking i was like whoa yeah. what's happening right now mind you i think it was just kind of like the uh it's like it was just triggered like breeding was triggered in the air um but then this is the one that kind of i felt like benefited from it the most right yeah and i just think it's time with these two because like i said it's been a while since i've seen the lock on them but my man like i like they're not set like they're they're not away from each other they're always here you know what i mean yeah and yeah. so i'm like and they may be they may be locking up when you're not watching them too could you know, be that happens all the time could be so yeah you know either way i, I just feel like it's kind of up to you to know or you know i guess your gut go with your gut and when to pull yeah. and not to pull as far as you know the male my, and stuff like that. my thought on this is um if she is in a state where she's actually ready to reproduce and he's good to go um, you don't have a super narrow window. You can, you can separate them for a few days to let them chill out and kind of reset and right. then put them back in. It, it really is a good trigger for them when you do that. Um, I do it with all my animals and I, I generally get a good response, uh, when they've been separated for a little bit and then you reintroduce, it's like, you know, uh, distance makes the heart grow fonder, you know, right. and it, it works. Yep, and these guys like some strange. I'll tell you that much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, going back to you applying the rain chamber method when needed, do you not spray your uh, chondros uh, because you rain chamber, or, or do you still spray when when you need to? Yeah, I generally don't spray. Um, my humidity is really high. The way I like to keep everything, I run ambient heat, so I don't have individual heaters on all the cages. Okay. Uh, the room's super humid. I've got several aquariums, uh, in my rooms. Oh, nice. That I, I uh, personally have in there for that. Um, so okay. the room is very humid and, um, I haven't really had a need to spray them directly in their, in their enclosures. Um, but it's definitely something down the road that I'm going to experiment with in terms of a, 
uh, like a built-in rain chamber system in the enclosure itself. That's a game changer having big wild aquarium tanks inside the same room. I and mean, that's definitely going to give you some humidity right there naturally. It does. Yeah. I grow live plants right out of the top. And then oh, I've got, cool. uh, you know, a fan that, you know, uh, circulates, you know, the, the air throughout the whole room and the whole thing. It's, it's, you can't be in there very long. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's definitely like a jungle. I bet they love it though. I bet that's they perfect do. for them. Um, yep. wh- I got to ask, you know, ambient heating, you know, I get, I get asked that all the time. Um, as far as what I do and what I prefer, uh, mm-hmm. I did ambient for quite a while and then just switched directions after I got the focus cubes and whatnot. So I'm curious what you like to run your ambient at, um, daytime, nighttime, that stuff. Yeah. Generally 82 to 83 during the day. Mm-hmm. And then I'll do a few degrees night drop, uh, during the, you know, the summer months. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then when it comes to the breeding season, I like to do a combination of triggers to get them to go. Um, I'll do a, a slightly larger nighttime drop, but then during the day, right back up to 82 to 83. Mm-hmm. And then I also do the heavy feed cycling. And then I also have windows uh, to the outside in each of these rooms. So even though they don't experience it in the wild, they get a, a, a light cycle naturally mm. uh, here. So I've got a combination of three different things that they're experiencing throughout the year that uh gets them to to go into a breeding cycle it's funny you brought the light cycle thing up because i i have a bit right behind the, these enclosures is a big window right and there's yep. no curtains because i like to naturally let the sun come up and just you know do that and i'm realizing man especially when it's prime time for breeding i don't even know if i should even run these these led lights um because I, I i feel like there has to be a like a time and place where they want a little bit of privacy like instead of just having a a light blasted on them 24 7 yeah um like you know the the way the room the the daylight room hits from that window it still lightens and shades the room naturally how it should yeah and then i think i'm just trying to save a little money on my electric bill too <laughs> do you do you run those lights 12 hours 12 hours yeah yeah you, you think that's too i um, i run some uvb just on a few of my animals um just to you know see if it makes a difference i've been doing it forever um I'll just add on UVB real quick. We don't have to go down that rabbit hole, but I think it's a bit overblown as to what UVB is doing for, for chondros specifically. Yeah. Uh, I do offer it. Uh, but generally my animals aren't being doused with, with direct light like you have in your cages uh, throughout the day. Mm-hmm. I've got room light and I've got natural light that comes in and, and that's it generally. And then the ones yeah. that get UVB it's on, I think for about an hour and a half midday is how long I have that turn on. That's about it. I mean, because I I could I could definitely see at some point of their day in the wild, it does get bright. Yep. It, ain't, it ain't bright like this 12 fucking hours. You know what I mean? So yeah. I, I think I'm definitely, first and foremost, paying too much money on my electric electricity bill because of it. But first and foremost, I don't, you know, I don't think it all needs it. You know, I, no, like they I don't. Said, maybe while I'm in the room, turn it on and then leave, turn it off. But yeah, I if anything, it's a, it might be a detriment. Uh, for them because they're definitely you know down underneath the canopy primarily it's a lot darker there in the wild they're not used to having light on them constantly um, and it just comes down to feeling secure and you know that all that plays into whether or not they're going to want to breed alexa turn off the focus wall <laughs> okay. i'm just not <laughs> 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 this is crazy like this just shows you how much like we kind of our own our own work not that like i did this purposely but god damn it like what's the point of having the lights on 12 fucking hours a day mj even when you're not here you have them on like yeah and, and my, like i said that window is big so i'm just like it's it, i'm laughing at myself right now i've been no, i hear I've been, you i've been doing this for over a year <laughs> yeah but mind you too like dude maybe they're annoyed by it maybe they're like dude it's so fucking bright like yeah they don't like it typically yep dang wow patrick you know what makes me upset about patrick holmes sometimes i'm very close to patrick and he's like yeah mj um just so you know stress inducing patrick why don't you just text me hey mj you know about your lights that i just saw you start implementing eight months ago they're stressful Patrick Holmes, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> the Condro community is very, very lucky to have Patrick Holmes. I want to say, hey, like this, this, this is a guy right here. I, I yeah, Patrick's a good guy. Yep. He's really, he's really one of the best, I would say. Um, but God damn it, yeah, I'm gonna. I think that's um, 
here we go. Less is more, right? With the yep. contract. People think they need to do more, but they Keep don't. Simple. They they don't. You, you got to rewind it a little bit. Like UVB, man. Like I get it. Like, you know, I, I, is it like, are you a piece of shit for not applying it to your animals? I don't think so. You know what I mean? No, I, think, not. I think people need to chill out a little bit. Yeah. Um, especially because people like you've kind of like, you've, you, you ran a couple tests with it and saw if there was any actual crazy like changes or anything like that or or can you maybe talk about and we, like i said we don't have to go down the rabbit hole but can you kind of tell us what you did personally that makes you feel like uvb doesn't need to be as put on a pedestal as it is right now well I, i'll just add i haven't seen anything that changed as a result of using uvb on chondros and i've been using it on them i think since uh 2014 maybe somewhere around there on these females and the whole thought was that um you know uh there's a few things so there's a few theories going around about why neonate chondros develop prolapses one of them being that um they're not getting uh the right calcium or d3 uh when the follicles are being formed and the yolks and everything else are are being created and then that transfers to the baby and they're being, you know, they're hatching malnourished uh, to the point where um, I know Bushmaster, when Vladimir was still alive and running that, the theory they had was that um, the, the female chondros were deficient in vitamin D3. And then that mm -hmm. transferred to the babies when they hatched and they were shedding teeth at a rate that was much higher than is probably natural and then they would get hung up in the intestine and cause a prolapse hmm. so my whole thought was well i'm gonna provide some uvb uh to see if i can you know help keep their d3 levels boosted um but i haven't seen a difference whatsoever between the animals that get uvb and those that don't in my collection uh everything has been identical nothing's different um, now does it improve their quality of life in some way that can't be measured or you can't uh see you know subjectively or anecdotally uh maybe um but i'm i'm not seeing it with chondros uh but even then you know i still offer it on some of them and um you know it's just one more thing that i, I include because i figured that they get exposed to some of it in the wild so i should probably offer them some in captivity that's really my whole thought process i still can't believe i've been leaving these lights on for that long yeah <laughs> yeah i live in san diego bro like the the it's it's perfect lighting here you know what i mean especially yeah. the way i have it sorry i'm gonna drop it but i'm just saying i'm i think i'm more happy looking forward to just not having to have the lights on you know i think yeah. that, i think that's great <laughs> are you kidding yeah, me? Yeah. um yeah so you know so many different i and I've, I've i've had this conversation a lot recently but what what do you feel like the most important cycling method is is it the feeding you would say or what do you think, you know, my, my opinion is multiple triggers are better than a single trigger. Um, I've had really good luck, uh, breeding these guys since I started in, in 2019. Um, mm -hmm. and I've been doing it this way pretty much from the beginning. Um, and I think as long as, you know, you've got uh, a couple things that, uh, can potentially get them into cycle, why not use them? And uh, it doesn't cause them any harm. Uh, so that's why I, I do a multiple approach rather than relying on a single one. Because here we are applying actual cycles happening where they're from. In yeah. a sense. Because yeah. there's, there's temperature changes throughout seasons. Yeah. Food, food availability changes throughout seasons, yeah. right? Yeah. So the life cycle doesn't in the wild i mean they you know it's typically 12 12 but 12. they're getting it here and i believe it works you know a light cycle all of these things are going to trigger uh yeah them to, to go into follicle I mean, development you, and okay I, I do know that these chondros can range like they could go from place to place but you don't really know what chondro is actually putting itself in the sun and not like like there's yeah. there could be a snake that is just so good at hiding and it wants to hide 24 7 i always say snakes aren't fucking they're not sociable they're not like hey what's going right. on today world like they're trying to hide and, and avoid from getting eaten like that's they they're born to have that mentality i feel like like look at a ball python biggest fucking scaredy crack cat on cat on earth you know what i mean yeah. but i also feel like that mentality almost applies not to every snake i do feel like 
like a reticulated python, whole, whole other breed. I, I feel like that thing's ready. Um, but like certain snakes that feel like they're vulnerable, just getting eaten by anything, they don't want to be seen. I feel like they're, and, and I feel like if they can avoid any kind of like visual interaction or whatever, they're okay with that. I, I other than them wanting to eat something, but yeah. I don't know. That's why it's like, you know, unless you're out there fucking doing field work and you're showing me documentation on how much sun uh Conjo is actually getting like throughout its life, you know, it's we don't really know that. Like we yeah, it could just be completely shaded all the time. Yeah, I think it's a safe bet to to say that they're probably not actively trying to go out and bask during the day. No. Um they're a small snake and there are lots of predators where they come from. So their whole, you know, uh, way of going about business is trying not to get eaten. And, you know, they're going to be in the under canopy for the most part. But even then, you still get sun that trickles down through. So they're getting some exposure right. to sunlight, you know, underneath the canopy. Now, I have to ask, you know, running an ambient, I feel like people have certain snakes with a hot spot available, like when ovulation happens. Are you doing that when you get ovulated snakes or what are you doing when a female ovulates? Yeah, so as soon as I get an ovulation, uh, and sometimes I'll do it even a few weeks before, I, I offer, um, I use, I like to use the 25 watt ceramic heat emitters as a hot spot. Mm -hmm. uh, they work extremely well, and uh, they're dirt cheap. And uh, I put that on there and I give them a spot that's roughly 85 degrees, maybe 86 at the most, okay. um, to give them the option. They definitely use it. What's your choice of substrate? None. So like meaning like just bare plastic or yeah, I use bare bottom oh, on cool. most of my cages. I use puppy pads on some and bare bottoms on others. They go to the bathroom so infrequently um, that it's not an issue. And, and I don't have humidity concerns like I was mentioning earlier. So what I do is when, you know, somebody messes their enclosure, I take them out and the whole enclosure goes to the, the wash sink and gets hosed out with, a, you know, extremely hot water. If puppy pads were a person, I would want to fight it. Yeah. I'm so I'm just it was kind of, it's almost like the lighting thing like I cannot believe I've been using this for this long where humidity is a constant battle for me um and, and mind you like you know Warren's like hey you know you know these are designed like if you have them up the way most people have them up which is yeah you know it's designed to hold in moisture it doesn't yeah. it doesn't expose it you know what I mean well it does release it it's just a slow release and I would guarantee you if you put a humidity gauge in there you know before you you wet it versus after, you're gonna see a bump in your humidity. Um, but it doesn't, I think it last, it doesn't last as long though. What doesn't? The humidity. Like I was noting, I was noticing mine like drying very quickly. Like it was mm -hmm. getting very dry, dry way too quick in yeah quicker than I wanted it to in in my enclosures. Yeah. Um, and then I noticed after like after Warren said that I pay close attention because I have you know I have tons of tons of friends who use puppy pads. You know yeah. what I mean. And I'm not saying, oh, nobody should. I'm saying for me personally, like now that, now that I have cocoa chip and I'm having these complete sheds all one after another, I'm like, hallelujah. You know what I mean? Yeah. But but for me personally, like it, it was just making my life more hard, more difficult. And also what it was, um, never had this happen with any chondros, but three times with an emerald, uh, two times with one, one with one, one of my favorite ones. But these damn emeralds like to wrap. They'll sit there for a while, and then after a while, they'll drop it and rewrap. And then mm. what happened when when I thought one was good to go, it dropped to rewrap, but then it hooked the, the puppy pad. And then gotcha. it started swallowing the puppy pad with the wrap. And I luckily, all through caught time, it. luckily, because I'm very like, I'm in here all the time, but I caught it. I caught it yeah. right at the perfect time where I could just like pull it out where it was like not fully down. You know what I mean? Like I just was lucky, and I was – I had it after that. I was like, I'm not, yeah. I'm not dealing with this shit, man. And so, I mean, I, I, like I said, I'd much rather even just go bare than have puppy pads. You know what I mean? I'm a, which, because I feel like I get you know, it. You know, I get it. it. Each their own. Like, you know, obviously yeah. I'm, I'm playing around when I say it's the devil's work, but for me it was. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I hear you. I, I think that's what makes, you know, chondros and emeralds really more interesting than a lot of the other snakes that you can keep because we don't have everything figured out. You kind of right. have to tailor their husbandry to your own location. And, uh, you know, it's it's not cookie cutter. And I think that's really what makes them interesting, you know? Yeah. And, yeah, and listen, no matter what someone swears by, if it don't work for you, it don't work for you. Right. And you don't need to use it. That's why I was like, you know, mind you, I only did it because, 
you know, my boy Socrates, I just like, you know, I just want to do what he does, you know, but my Jason, sure. South Florida, he has, you know, he does a lot less Different. what he has to do with humidity than I do. And also when I, what I was gonna say about Socrates, he flips his pads upside down. Um, yeah. And, and, and I noticed the droplets are like sitting on top of the pad versus getting soaked in. So I was like, huh, that was a, that was a smart one. I just realized yeah. that, now. but yeah. Either way, teach their own. Um, now, since we're on the uh, subject of substrate, what about your neos? Like, what, let's, let's 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 kind of talk about establishing the neonates, because goddamn, that's a lot of my heartbreak comes from not adults dying on me. It's my own productions dying on me. You know, I've had yeah. quite a bit of experiences uh, last year with prolapses. Um, this year was a fucking the way I cooked them in the incubator. Um, yeah. So I want to hear some of the maybe do's and don'ts that you've experienced with establishing neos and what you what you feel like is a good solid foundation when it comes to them coming out the egg first shed all that good stuff you know what i mean yeah. what you prefer yep so um again keep it simple i i like to use six quart sterilite tubs and a simple perch that you know i i produce and then an eight ounce deli cup uh with fresh water and i don't use a substrate and um babies go to the bathroom very frequently mm -hmm. so i'm constantly washing the tubs out and they're almost always you know they're they almost always have beads of water on the sides and on the bottom and and you know on the lids and that kind of stuff so that um you know they're they're not drying out that's super important with with fresh babies uh having fresh clean water available on a very regular basis is very important. Yeah. And then that's it. You keep them simple. And I, and I run them at the same temperature as my adults. So 82 degrees, they're sitting in the room. Um, there's no heat gradient. Um, they do perfectly fine. Um, and then in terms of feeding, uh, I like to, you know, hit them with uh, whole pinks right from the beginning. If they'll take, um, if I get some that are runners or they're extremely shy and they don't want to strike, I don't bother beating them up. I go right to assist feeding with mouse legs and mouse tails. And I'll continue doing that on those until they, the switch gets flipped and they decide they want to start eating whole pinks. Do you like to go mouse tail first or the leg first? I, I do both, but I tend to prefer the, the mouse legs. Patrick uh, put me onto that a, a few years back. And um, there's just a little more to them. You know, they've got a uh, full bone. There's some marrow. There's a good, you know, ham hock on there. And, I also include some of the skin in the fur for roughage and, and fat, and uh, it's done really well. Uh, I don't sweat babies not eating at all anymore. Uh, if they eat right out of the gate, that's fantastic. If they don't, well, then I just put them on assist feeding until they do. And then, yeah. you know, they almost all switch to, to eating on their own after a while. Yeah, I just feel, you know, like I said, I haven't had that much experience, but I do know when a runner's a runner, you ain't going to get nowhere with that fucking snake. No, nope. you, you, you nope. need to just you're fighting get, it and there's no yeah. point. Yeah. Let me ask you this, too, Dave, with the experience of you having to assist feed at what point on an average are you seeing it turn the corner? Like, are we talking like there's a range? Yeah, mm -hmm. um, it could be, you know, a month. It could be several months. Matter of fact, today's a good day. I actually had two babies that finally ate whole pinks on their own. Right. Uh, that Huge. I've been assist feeding since, uh, was it May, I think. Okay. Um, so, you know, it, they're all individuals. Some are going to take a long time and some of them not. Um, and then uh, just real quick, I wanted to touch base on prolapsing too. So yeah, please. Um, that's been uh, a very common thing, um, and particularly with fresh hatches. And uh, there's, you know, several theories that are get, you know, thrown around. They, I think for a while people were thinking that the babies weren't hydrated enough um, or they weren't getting vitamin D, you know, those kind of things. And, and uh, I think now what I'm seeing is that, um, yes, you want to make sure they're hydrated and I do, but I don't think that's the primary issue with, with fresh babies prolapsing. I think what it has to do is we're feeding them a prey item that's not natural to them. Um, and they have a very difficult time passing pinkies. Uh, and some babies are going to be more susceptible to it than others. Uh, maybe there's like a, a slight uh, developmental thing that some babies are still going through when they hatch. Maybe they're, um, you know, the, the, um, 
the the linings or the the tissues that connect the intestines to like the sidewalls of their body aren't robust or fully formed. Mm -hmm. And when we're feeding them a, a prey item like a pinky that has zero roughage or fiber or anything in it, they they get diarrhea and they struggle really hard with passing that item and they end up pooping out their guts. And I I think, you know, the the moment you can get them onto something that has a little bit of fur on it, uh, you're going to be doing a lot better because now you've introduced something that can allow the movement of that material through their system. Um, right. that, that's my theory now. I've had enough of them that have done it um, that I'm almost certain it has more to do with us feeding them pinkies uh, versus what they eat in the wild. So yours is, you know, if you have a conjure that, or if you have a, a Neo that's willing to take a, a pinky on its first go, it for sure has chick down on it is what you're saying? Yeah, well, that's how I'll start. I'll I'll um, typically just go ahead and put chick down on them. I don't even bother doing it without to start. Mm -hmm. um, and then they'll eat that, and then I'll switch uh, to ones that you know where I don't use the chick down at all. And then I try to get them onto larger prey items as quickly as possible, so that there's a little bit of fur there too. Um, yeah to help them with that process i know every neo has its way of growing like as far as speed of growth and whatnot but typically when are you getting like a fuzzy into that neo you think if it, if it all works out yeah um it's really you know it's just it's the size of the fuzzy versus the size of the animal you know i i eyeball it to see if i think they can handle it or not um, all of my hatches that you know hatched earlier this year are on small fuzzies now um and they were on large pinks for quite a while which also have some fur um so yeah i tried to get away from the hot pinks as quickly as possible the ones that have no fur on them whatsoever um basically a little skin of blood a little better what's that basically just a skin with with blood in it yep yep yeah yeah man and, and mind you that you know the the year i dealt with prolapses is they were all taking these hot pinks like day one just born zero bone development pinks you know what i mean yeah um and they were they were they still had what you call in them um chick down and whatnot but mm -hmm. i don't know I, I i think i kept them on those for way too long and that's kind of what happened because yeah, a lot of them I, didn't pull up so they didn't i'm sorry I didn't, I, I, a lot of them didn't pull up so after like their eighth ninth meal and i was like yeah. what and i couldn't fucking believe it yeah I'm yeah sorry, that, that sucks but i i firmly believe that now my opinion is that uh, it really has to do with them eating those very small pinkies with no fur, no roughage. It's very hard for them to pass. And, you know, you want to get off of those as quickly as possible. And, and it's interesting. I've had some clutches where uh, I've had a run where uh, quite a few of them developed a prolapse. Um, and then I'll have clutches where I'll have none that do. That's why I think there's an interaction there with, how well developed is that baby when it first comes out of the egg and can it handle the hot pinks for a period of time till you can get them onto a better prey item. And I think just some babies are not as developed and they're way more susceptible to it. Um, yeah. That's what I'm seeing. You know what? It, I'm just, just a thought, right? Because if we're talking about these little mini ham hocks being best for the Neos, like, why don't we just offer those straight off the bat? Why are, why are we even still messing with pinks when if we don't if we could just chop a bunch of these legs up and have them ready to go? Um, it's not curious. ideal uh, because you know at least with the pink, um, the nutritional value is still pretty decent. I mean, you've got all the organs in there that you're not going to get with uh, a mouse leg. It's really just something to to at least give them enough nutrition so they can continue growing, but really slow. But it's not, uh, a, it's not the complete package is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. And it's really just like maintaining them so that they don't lose too much weight and perish. Right. Uh, if you can do that, then after a while, what happens is it's almost like a switch gets flipped. Mm -hmm. And they decide that, okay, I'm, I'm down for eating whole prey now. Um, it's really kind of fun to watch. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. I, don't, I haven't been there, but. <laughs> it's coming. It's coming. <laughs> I know. bro here's the thing man like i could keep getting beat up and i'm not going anywhere like i i first and foremost yeah. i got all my buddies who are successful at it so i i live through them for now um and, and also i mean i keep my adults well in their lives so i mean i'm yep. i'm having fun you know what i mean it's just yeah it's a matter of time yep yep um what are some of the biggest mistakes right now you feel like uh because i'm not gonna lie man 
I've been pretty going. I've been going condo heavy pretty lately as far as content on this on this podcast, mm -hmm. just because why not? You know, and and people are starting to hit me up, and, and you know, you got a lot of people wanting to switch lanes a little bit and go from ball pythons to chondros yeah. um but I, and i and, and i say man con keeping chondros are easy but also easy to fuck up right yeah um, i want to know some of the things that you have to maybe correct for a lot of new keepers like so, you know like let's just say somebody just buys a three thousand dollar you know dab neo from you um you know what are some of the mistakes you feel like people are making right off the bat and, and whatnot yeah. i i think what i see more often than not is uh and I get it 100%. People want to buy this animal that's super cool and likes to perch out in the open. And they want to create this really elaborate, beautiful enclosure for them with bioactive and live plants and, and you know, everything you can imagine. Um, but when you're getting a, a, a baby that's just been recently established, uh, that's the last thing you want to do is be throwing them in an enclosure like that, particularly for somebody who's inexperienced, which most of these people are. Um, they think they're doing right by the animal, but the reality is you're probably going to stress them out and you're not going to know how to get them to, to settle down and to eat regularly and that kind of stuff. So uh, the main piece of advice I can give anybody who's just like recently getting into chondros, keep it really simple and follow the advice of the breeder that you got it from and how they raise that baby to the point where they're selling it to you. And then that's going to be your best recipe for success. Keep it simple. Don't do these elaborate, crazy setups. You can do that when you've got more experience under your belt and you've got several you know, years down the road where you've kept this thing and you're really in tune with how that animal should be behaving and how it should look when it's perching and what the warning signs are and things like that. Um, don't jump into that immediately. That's the one piece of advice I can give people. And as much as it's like, all right, man, great advice, Dave. This sounds very crystal clear what you're saying. Some people can't fucking help it, bro. No, like, they're going to do it anyway. And it's like, why are you putting this thing in a three by two when it needs like it, it was just born four months ago. Like, right. you know what I mean? And, 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 oh, I saw this on animal planet. No, dude. Like, and, and, and like, it's like people think, I think I discovered something that they don't know and it's going to work. And it's like, you don't no. think we've all seen this shit? Like, yeah. like, just please slow down. And I only say that because that this one mistake that you're going to make with this $3,000 animal, you think you're going to want to make the same mistake again? You, you'll probably run away, go collect rocks or never think right. about making this mistake ever again. Cause death sucks. But imagine when something dies and it's that expensive. Oh, you're going to feel it. Oh, yeah. It and it's avoidable. Yeah. It sucks. And, 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 you know, sometimes you have to learn the hard way. Yep. Um, yep. I know, I know I did for sure. I, I know a lot of people too. There's, there's a really bad habit of people to say, you know, well, I, I did it and I was successful. So what's the problem? Yeah. Um, you know, that's not the majority of cases and, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I'm talking specifically about people who don't have the experience yet. You know, if you're somebody who's been keeping chondros for five, 10 years and has been breeding them and, and knows them inside now, yeah, go for it. You know, set them up the way you want. You're, you'll know if the animal is, is doing well or not and if you need to change it up. But if you're inexperienced, you don't even know what to look for. You don't know if the animal's doing well or not. And uh, nine times out of 10, they're going to go off feed and they're not going to know what to do to get them back on. And that's all avoidable if they just keep it simple at the beginning. Yeah. And another thing to pay close attention to what Dave's saying is like, man, if you are very inexperienced as far as keeping what you're purchasing and this is the first time, then be very close to the person you're buying it from. Like, yeah, like it, it, first and foremost, like if it's someone like a Patrick Holmes or David Brahms or Bill Stiegel, like, dude, that's hello. They're fucking yeah. doing it right. But that is your, that's your coach. That's your go-to. Yeah. And, 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 life's a lot easier if you listen to the person who's teaching you, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's kind of like, don't, don't be your own worst enemy here. Like just, and, and you could get to the glory days of a bioactive. If you really want that dream, you can, but just yeah. wait, just Down wait. Down the road. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and, and I do, cause I've seen Dave, I've seen some people go all out and I'm like, wow, it's impressive. You know what I mean? But they built it to that. Like they built stages to get to that point. Right. You know what I mean, and, and mind you too, a lot of people will say they, there's no perfect bioactive out there. People have to rearrange or do something where something happens. And it's just like, we're talking about the kiss method here. Yeah. Keeping chondros is the kiss method. It is, it is just keeping it super simple. Like just 
and watch the reward you get by just following these simple steps. It's it's just kind of what I feel like is an imprint when keeping yeah. on those. I've never really quite understood the the whole push for bioactives specifically. And you know, talking about chondros too, that I what is it that you hope to gain with bioactive versus naturalistic? And mm. you know, you can set up a killer looking enclosure that's naturalistic, but is also very easy to maintain and keep clean, but also looks like a jungle. And you don't need a cleanup crew with a chondro. They go to the bathroom so infrequently. I don't even know what the point is of, of having active soil and isopods and all that in a chondro enclosure. Um, they, get, they get fresh shit know. to eat once every two weeks. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, listen, teach their own. Yeah, I think yeah. a lot of it is like people coming in based off a YouTube video they saw or like sure. something on TV and they're like, I want, like, I want to, if I want to conjure, this is what I want it in. And that's fine. You know what I mean? Yep. But it's like, if you're going to invest into something, regardless if it's a pet or whatever, you know, just how there's instructions on anything else you buy in life. These are the instructions, and yep. these, especially if these are clear instructions coming from the person you're buying it from. Yeah. Um, because like, let's just say something doesn't work and, and you did everything that this person, well, I got to tell you more likely that guy's even like, well, you know what? Well, let's make it right or whatever. But mm -hmm. you're just, you're keeping yourself from a lot of headaches by just doing everything that the seller tells you to do. Cause if something does, you know, messed up happens, you're going to be like, dude, I'm doing everything you're telling me to do here. You know what I mean? Yeah. Versus like, Oh yeah, I found it in the, uh, my waterfall. I have a natural waterfall. Right. Yeah. It won't yeah. get out. <laughs> yeah. I, I know as a, as a breeder and someone who's selling condros, you know, you want the, the person that purchased that animal from you to be successful um, because yeah, it's going to make them happy. But at the end of the day, it's also going to make you happy because you're not having to hold somebody's hand forever to try and get all these problems solved. Uh, when everything could have been avoided at the beginning if they just kept it really simple to start. Yeah. You know, and, you know, luckily I, uh, like my heart, my biggest experience with condos were imports. Like I fucking, because I didn't have money. I didn't have, you know, yep. Captain Born and Brennan. But I did too. Yeah. yeah. I, I, all I could afford was imports. And mind you, I, man, I went through the ringer. I went, like I was doing things simple and they were still dying. And I'm like, what's happening? And I realized, you roll the dice every time you do an import. It doesn't matter yep. how simple you keep it or how great your quarantine method is or how great that panicure is. If, if this snake is fucked up, it's fucked up and there's nothing right. you can do about it. And that's it. But then when I realized I had a snake that wasn't messed up and it was going the distance, all I ever wanted to do was keep it simple. That was like, you know, like, dude, this is what works for them. I'm not messing with that. And that's, right. you know, cause I just enjoy their, them being here that's that's the beauty about working with imports like it makes you appreciate whatever's still here like yep. you're, yeah <laughs> you know what I mean? and you're just yeah. happy with what's here and and i and i always say man what what's what's on your perch i want to say 80 percent of the snakes on, on your on your perches right now are imports and, and 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 there are some of the ones i first i mind you and this is from when i first started like six years ago you know and yeah and as much as i went through the ring with imports my the guy who was hooking me up did take care of me with the ones that were solid and uh but it was just kind of like you know i didn't get mad at him like if, if one didn't make it it's like dude it's yeah it's what it is you know what i mean you're um, on the dice yeah and you know and, and and mind you a lot of people out there are just there's they're not everyone but a lot more people are like i'd rather save until i have money for a united states captain board and bread because yeah there is there is no roll in the dice in a sense like you're yeah. you're, you're gonna get something solid you know what i mean yeah. Yep. And, and, and I'm curious on how you stand by that for yourself. Like, you know, I, I was just, you know, obviously we pull up your website here and then we could see that um, if somebody wants to inquire one of your animals, right? Like you provide the lineage, like you provide, like, here we go. We have, this is your availability, correct? Everything that's yeah. right here. Yep. So if we were to click on this animal right here, right? Um, this right here kind of obviously breaks down the price, but also shows you the pairing. Yep. So if somebody is like, well, I want to make sure that my snake has like a blue color to it or whatever. Mm -hmm. Are you guaranteeing that with a snake like this because of the light lineage or like, what do you tell somebody like that? Like, you know, no, I mean? no, I definitely don't guarantee it. You know, it, you're, you're dealing with animals that um, it's polygenic. So you don't know what they're going to turn into uh, when they're an adult. Um, but if you have repeat pairings, um, 
you kind of get an idea as to what that particular pairing is going to produce. Right. Uh, and also you get a better feel on the babies. Uh, you know, you, you start looking for specific things on babies that uh, will tell you more likely than not the animal is going to look a certain way when it's an adult. Um, but you can't guarantee that they're going to be all blue. But what I tell people is that like, you know, my Dr. Jones and Mako pairing, um, I've produced, you know, three clutches from them and I've gotten quite a few, uh, out of there that have uh, a high amount of blue on them when, you know, they mature and specifically with the Manaquari and the Prada lineage, the, those kind of animals tend to gain more blue with age as well. Right. Um, so, you sure. know, I, I can lead them in a direction and say, you know, there's a good chance this one's going to end up looking like this one. Cause I, you know, I've saved, you know, a bunch of animals from the previous clutches. So I have right. things to compare to, and, um, you know, I can show them that, you know, this is what all these animals have looked like when they've matured. So, you know, you, you got a pretty good bet that it's going to look, you know, like something that you want. How many Neos have you produced so far, David, with this kind of coloration, like this tone of red, like this kind of like that, that, that it's more of a maroon. Yeah. That's color. what I look for. Um, I've, I mean, I've had some with a lighter red that, you know, develop a fair amount of blue too, but it's really kind of the brownish maroon red that I look for, uh, with this, the animals that I'm producing right now. Uh, in addition to that, the diamonds, uh, I like to see a nice, you know, yellowy, burnt yellow look in the diamonds in conjunction with that uh, brownish maroon color. Um, all the animals that have looked like that so far out of that pairing when they've matured have looked really good. I mean, I know we can't speak for everyone right now, but how many people, I know Patrick's in the building, how many people out there have produced a neonate chondral with this kind of coloration that did not turn out to be ridiculous? Like I, and I know we can't guarantee anything, but like, like if we have something this crazy red looking, like it's pretty favorite that it's going to lean into something crazy looking, right? You would yeah. say, Kids are, many, it's going to, it's going to look nice. How many sure. of these have just turned green? Like how many of these red type of red Neo, how many of these type of red Neos just turn out to be a green looking normal chondro? I, that's what I'm curious. I don't think they're, I don't think that's the case at all. Yeah. At least I know with the animals that I produce out of that, uh, pairing that I was talking about earlier, the ones that look like that generally have a pretty substantial blue wash when they do finally go through their color change. And then over time that just gets enhanced over the years, they become more and more blue as time goes on. I'm a sucker for that red man. Not gonna lie. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's like, you know, obviously we just see how intense, like I'm sure your holdbacks are even more red than this. Right. I'm assuming. Yeah, I mean, it, that's the look you're looking for, though. <laughs> yeah. That maroony, brownish red. Now, I do notice you have some yellows available. Um, now, obviously, that determines on the pairing when you'll get yellows. But are we talking a yellow like this had other reds in the clutch? Or were this all yep. yellow? Was this a pure yellow clutch? No, that, that came out of uh, the, the same clutch as the one that you were just looking at. Wow. Okay. Or awesome. yeah, that one or that actually this is a different clutch, but it's same type of lineage. So when we have a neonate like that, right? Because a lot of people, I'm sure, not a lot, but I'm sure some people would ask you what are what's more likely the snake to throw if it were to produce red or yellow. A lot of these are it's up in the air, correct? Because of the lineage, like it could do red or yellow, or are some of these capable of just giving you reds and stuff like that i'm curious yeah i you need to have a dominant red uh animal in the pairing in order to get all red uh, okay. in the clutch um but like for mine they're majority red and then i'll get a couple yellows uh with these specific pairings right. i've got another uh pairing a little bit lower on the page there all those animals uh came from a, a pairing where there's a red dominant wamena as the male uh, so every animal that was produced is a super dark red uh, baby. Wow. So they're considered the super, it would be considered a super red then. Yep. Yep. Nice. I had no clue about that until recently. Yeah. When I, no, last year when I um, had a red Neo Biak to a yellow Neo Biak, 16, all red. And yep. I was like, whoa. And then yep. this year, the same male that sired that clutch, 
yep. all red neos and yep. I, I didn't know super red was a thing i had no yep. no idea but super red's a good thing for oh sure very good thing yep um so and, and then and then mind you the only way again like just to be clear the only way you get a super red neo is if one of the sires or one of the parents are supers correct yeah yeah okay um because other than that, like if we were to put something like, like you know, if we were to put one of these snakes to, let's just say, a yellow neonate uh, or a yellow monocory or a yellow um, sarong, then there's there's a chance of getting yellows, obviously, right? Yeah, there is. But keep in mind, too, that both the parents in the pairing were red. So you should oh, have some shit. babies in this clutch that are super red as a result of that. Mm. And going forward, you know, they, they should produce all red clutches. But red to red can make a super red, is what you're yeah. saying? Yeah, oh. you can. Yep. Got you. Man. All right, guys, do me a favor. <laughs> First and foremost, don't tire kick this guy, but go to his damn website. See his availability. Um, Because this is all stuff from this year, obviously. These are all your Neos from this year. Yeah, I don't have everything posted either. I just haven't had the time. Okay. How yeah, many- I had, uh, I think, 46 babies this year out of four clutches. <laughs> Congrats. Out of four clutches? Yeah. Huge. Is, is that your biggest year or you normally do about four clutches a year? No, nah, that's my biggest year. I paired six this year and got four clutches. Congrats, man. That's awesome. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's, and I know we've been talking about things being good for you right now as far as neonate establishing. Um, is that been a walk in the park for the most part with all four clutches this year? Or what's going it's, on with that? It's been standard. Um, I think out of the 46, I had about a dozen of them that required assist feeding for a while. Okay. Uh, and then now I'm down to, I think, two out of that dozen that are still holding out. Anything you're assist feeding that you really want to keep back that you're like, oh, God, this thing's badass, but it's like I have to go through this shit? Um, no, not out of the assist feeders, but I do have some from the others that um, I'm definitely going to be holding back. Let's talk about that real quick. Um, sure. And what I, what I mean is, like, let's just say there's the – the diamond of the clutch, right? Like you're just like, and it's a pain in the ass feeder. Like it is just, yeah, I don't like that. Yeah. So what, so I'm, but I'm curious, like, 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 and let's just say it's ridiculous, Dave, you never seen anything like it. Are you still more likely to get rid of that snake or are you going to hold on to it? No, if it's something crazy, I'm going to hold on to it. Um, Regardless how big of a weak eater it is. Yeah. Uh, it's not preferable, but if it's something crazy looking, obviously I'm going to keep it for the phenotype and then just deal with the, the feeding issues. <laughs> um, but my preference is, you know, I give this advice to anybody that's out there buying chondros as babies that, you know, one of the things that you want to talk about is how difficult was this baby to get established? You know, right. uh, I think, you know, your success rate with something that was raring to go out of the gate is preferred, uh, versus something that you had to, you know, struggle with for eight months. You know what I mean? Um, but that's just my personal preference. Yeah, you know, if I've, you know, this is why I'm like always been a fan of my, you know, a lot of my imports are BX, like they're, you know, solid because it's like you can't go wrong if you have BX in the, in the, in the, in the mix, right? Because how aggressive yeah. they are for the most part it certainly helps. But it's like, damn, man, like imagine that, you know, because I, I, I don't know who I talked to, probably a few people tell me that that does trickle down into the, into the babies a week, a week eating parent like that that it some, can they can yep. yeah, you think oh yeah absolutely i think all of that is something that you can control for uh unfortunately chondros you know they breathe so infrequently and it takes a long time for them to mature but ideally you know you would want to line breed uh for really strong feeders that would be ideal but it's kind of difficult to do with these guys because the time span is so long <laughs> um to be able to do that but that's certainly something i know there have been breeders in the past who they don't mess around with uh babies that are fussy eaters they call them out oh yeah right out. right young man he don't yep. play <laughs> yeah yeah and i don't necessarily disagree with that you know you're I mean, you're it's another variable that you can control uh with your breeding program and it definitely plays a part there's genetics involved with that it's just when you're when you have that much you know, experience under your belt and you know what you're breeding for. Like you're not yeah. breeding for the weak. You're breeding for the top Supreme period, like superior, you know? Yeah. And, and Ryan Young was the first one to like, when he, when he was telling me his methods on when he offers, it's complete 180 from everyone else. And I'm just yeah. like, Whoa. Yeah. 
And he's yeah. like, and he's like, I don't even know when I, I was like some, like sometime after they shed, like, I don't know, a few weeks or something. Yeah. Like, yeah. He right. doesn't stress. Yeah. yeah. He's like, I don't even. And then like, I remember I was asking about the white lips and he's like, oh, I think I checked on him once and boom, she was on a, she was on eggs. I'm like, wow, thanks. That's very informative. <laughs> and he's like, I don't know what to tell you, man. He's like, I don't really look. I just fucking, you know, I just, yeah. And it's like, fuck. Like, I, I just, think, yeah, that reminds me. One of the things that I think really uh, comes into play that I don't think people talk about very much with breeding chondros because they're not, you know, nailed down. It's not an exact science. Um, right. That uh, stability, I think, really comes into play. Mm. Um, I My philosophy with these guys in my snake room is when I get them set up uh, in their adult, in the uh, adult enclosure is – they're going to stay there unless there's some weird reason I have to move them. Uh, but they're going to stay in that enclosure and that enclosure is going to stay in the same spot. And I'm not going to be messing with them very much. And the whole thing is just maintaining stability and, and leaving them alone. And I think that really comes into play with them feeling comfortable and, and going through a breeding cycle. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, I, I think, uh, I don't know. I, I think some of the most important things we're talking about after everything I'm hearing tonight is just finding something that triggers what it is that you're trying to get going first and foremost when it comes to breeding. But if you could do everything as far as trigger all triggers, you're, I don't see how that's going to go against you, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. But it works for me. Yeah. yeah I, I noticed that. And, you know, I, I know Gary does all three too. And, you know, other people as well. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't know. Do you feel like overall the Conjure, you know, craze will continue to pick up as where it is? It's going to get more popular? Or do you think like there will get a moment where it kind of plateaus and just stays niche as it is now? I, I'm curious where you feel like things are headed. I, I suspect that it's going to grow. Uh, and I think that's all thanks to the, the ball python craze. I think yeah. that was great in terms of getting a lot of people into the hobby who may not have otherwise. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine that those people are going to want to broaden their horizons a little bit and start dabbling in other stuff. So I think, um, you know, we'll probably benefit quite well from that going forward. I'd be surprised if we didn't. And mm -hmm. that's another reason why I got into Condros is that, um, you know, the, the price of Condros has remained fairly stable if anything they've gone up and yeah. down and that comes down to the whole fact that um you know people aren't super successful reproducing them uh and keeping them so the market um that you know by default has kept the market relatively healthy over the decades and i don't think that's going to change anytime soon and that's the biggest reason why i will go through the heartbreak i will go through fucking hell to get to that yeah. point where i'm like you know what I'm working with something that you can't fuck with these prices. <laughs> right. You yeah. can't because it's like, bro, like first and foremost, like the pain, the suffering, the the, yeah. the timing, the the energy that is put into this. And then you finally get to that point. You know, this is why I commend people like Bill and yourself and Socrates who are having like blowout seasons, but like, dude, that didn't happen overnight. Are you kidding me? Like, no. and, 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 and it's some, it's some, it doesn't happen for some people at all. You know what I mean? Right. So yeah. it's kind of like, you know, you just don't know where it takes you, but just hold on tight. And part of it, I think part of it's a numbers game too for people. Definitely numbers, bro. It's I know numbers. Bill has mentioned that before. Um, yeah. You know, I if you've only got a pair, um, they might not be compatible for whatever reason. And you're never going to get a clutch out of them. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of things that come into play um, mm -hmm. that I think prevent people from reproducing them. But if you are able to amass a fairly decent collection, maybe 10 or 12 animals to get going, um, your chances of success are going to go up exponentially. I really believe that. But in, in the chondro world, in the reality of the chondro world, that's not the case. You don't come in and buy 10, 12 females because no. that, they're, they're not even around. Like, where no, you no, no, no. Find no, buy you babies. Mean? That's what I yeah. did. You know, get them as right. babies. That, I think that's another key point for people to know is you're not going to go out and buy uh, wild-caught, you know, sub adults or adults and then jump into the condo game and start reproducing and making a ton of money. This is not how it works. Yeah. Um, I think the best bet, it's a slow game. It's a long game. You have to, you know, I think the safest and most successful way to do it is to buy them as babies, raise them in your house and in your environment, your husbandry methods and, 
And it all, again, comes down to stability, that they get used to what your routine is, the way you're keeping them, and they feel um, settled and safe and that they can reproduce. Uh, I think that's a, a much better uh, way of going about it versus going out and just buying, you know, older animals and trying to get them to go. I'm definitely not buying them as babies and waiting five years. I'm definitely not speaking for every green tree python keeper out there, but a lot of them will tell you that shit that goes wrong with a breeding pair or a breeding femur, whatever, is one that they inquired as an adult. Like yeah. one, that they, one that they already got that was already either breeding before or has never bred but has been old or whatever. Yeah. Dude, that's when you're more likely going to be like, I just wasted my fucking money right now. Yeah, probably. Uh, yeah. Versus establishing something, watching it raise up. Like, and I, I think Marshall was like, dude, I've never had, or if it was a Marshall, I forgot. Somebody's like, I've never had an issue with anything breeding that I raised myself. Like, right. meaning, like if I raised it, it's fucking tits. Yep. But if it, if it comes from the outside coming in, who knows? Yep. You know what yep. I mean? Yep. So, man, great fucking podcast. A lot of information. I got to say, Dave, I'll need you back on for sure, man. This is, uh, yeah, man, anytime. Barely got talking. And, and like I said, I, I, um, Huge fan of your work, not only your productions, but just what you have going on for the availability for people to have with purchase and whatnot. Do you feel like uh, you have anything new you want to roll out at some point? You know, because one of the things I want to go ahead and implement that you just said today were like the little addition purchase that you could like that you have, like 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 ones that just stick out, like little skinnier ones. Yeah. I would like to maybe add those if possible or, or sure, maybe have yeah. I just think that's that could be crucial, you know, for anything uh that you know, as far as options go but do you have anything like and you don't have to get details but do you have anything new that you might roll out soon or anything like that that you're thinking of yeah i, I don't have anything super new um what i will add is i i do have uh, a neonate enclosure that i sell that i'm not sure a lot of people are aware of it um is, that I, your, is it on your website it is yeah it out, it's called it the tranquility base and the mm -hmm. whole thought behind it was if you're like uh super new uh, to, you know, keeping green trees and you're about to get your first baby. Um, this allows you to, uh, set them up almost identical to how the breeder was probably keeping it. If where, where's, where's, where's it under right here? It's, I know it's under shop, but which one, what uh, category is it? It should, I can't really see it because the fox Enclo is Okay. Is it yep. enclosure? Enclosure? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, uh, oh wow. Here we go. Train. Yep. Oh, wow. All right. Go ahead. Can, keep talking. Yeah. So the whole thought was that if you're new to chondros and you don't know how to keep them and you want something super simple and will also replicate how the breeder was keeping them, which is key when you're getting your first chondro uh, so that they continue feeding and that sort of stuff. This is a single tub set up uh, in a, it's like a one single cubby of a rack is basically what this is uh, trying to replicate. And right. it's got heat tape in the back and it's a simple, you know, pull out drawer with a tub and a perch. And, uh, it just allows them to get them set up super simple and, and make it easy for them. It's like plug and play. It's plug very and simple. Play. Yep. Dude. Wow. This is so cool. And mind you, man, I, I, I speak to so many people who are like, dude, MJ, I don't want all these. I just want to start like with one and I'm like, dude, yep. this, is, this is ideal. And mind you, these are people who don't even have any snakes. They're like, right. I just want to start with one. And yeah. if we're talking about, if you're that type of person who wants to listen to instructions and want to take the simple route, this thing is going to be so perfect for you. It really is because you can't go wrong. Obviously you get a right therm the correct thermostat, but we're talking fresh water, paper towels, if you want, or just yep. water over. And we're, that's how simple it is. And, and, and we're talking about a snake living in this ideally for how long before it goes to the next step, about a year or so. Right. If not even longer, it's a 16 right. quart tub. So, you know, you can, you know, if it's a smaller subspecies, you can get two years out of it. And also somebody just said that they have two of them and, and, and they also make great quarantine tubs after a while too. That's so right. Like, yeah. If you do upgrade to a different style, you could have these for quarantines for all your future additions. Yep. Yep. Very neat, man. That's awesome. Stoked. All right. Listen, um, I have some hot seat questions for you before we let you go. Dave, are you cool with that? Yeah, shoot. All right, guys. I don't even have to say nothing about getting the likes up because the likes are super up. They're respectful and very <laughs> – you know, Thanks, people, everybody. <laughs> yeah, people are loving this show, man. Uh, so thank you for all the likes out there. Appreciate um, it. We're going to do these hot seat questions for David Brom. So in case you haven't, hit that like button. But here we go. Hot seat questions. Uh, are you ready for these, Dave? Yep. 
Here we go. Coming in hot. Frozen thought or live? Frozen. Eight cut or no cut? It depends. Sorry. <laughs> Dave, it's either yes or no, my man. I cut. On what day or what circumstances would you cut? So what I do is if uh, I get the first animal or two to pip, if the eggs are super dented in, uh, I will give them about a day. And if I don't see any more pips, the ones that are really dented in, I'll go ahead and, and manually cut them. Uh, but if there are eggs in that clutch that are still really plump and haven't dented in much, I'll leave those for a few more days before I, I do anything with them. I'm gonna uh, this year, I decided, you know, not to cut just for the hell of it. And I wanted to see, you know, was it really necessary for me to do that? And everybody hatched on their own, no problem whatsoever. And, you know, there's a range in terms of timing as to when they hatch, too. I'll get some that'll hatch, and then I won't get others hatch for another day or two after that within the same clutch. How many have you noticed dead in the egg, like fully developed, just dead in the egg? Very few. So that's another thing, too. I, I do different than I think most people. I incubate my eggs directly in vermiculite. They're not suspended or anything like that. I, I prefer that, that method, and it's worked really well for me. What's your ratio of ver vermiculite to water? So I do slightly uh, less than a one-to-one -one ratio. So I have the vermiculite just slightly drier, so maybe like 85 to 90% water to the vermiculite. And my incubator, it's a wet incubator. I run it really humid and the egg boxes are vented throughout the entire process. Um, and I've had great success hatching them that way. What are you doing to humidify your incubator so like great? So I have a water well. I use a big igloo cooler and I have a water well on the bottom. Mm -hmm. And then I built platforms above that and I've got uh, Cambro uh, tubs that I keep the eggs in, uh, in vermiculite. They're buried probably, I don't know, maybe 30% up the height of the egg. Uh, and then I have one single vent hole on one end of the tub that's open uh, throughout the whole process. Um, and I have a, a recirculating fan in the cooler that runs all the time. And I run them this year. I did them at approximately 86 degrees. 86 and yep. what what day are you getting pips normally uh i need to go look but i think i got like day 53 54 somewhere around there whereas wow. before when i was running them you know around 87 degrees they were hatching at day 49 50 <sighs> great noted um red chondra or yellow chondra <laughs> <laughs> uh red have you seen a yellow that has really blown your mind though. I mean, is there, is there yellow yeah. out there that you, that's really, I, I, I say red hesitantly. Uh, I love yellow babies too. And I say this all the time. I, I, I'm, I'm sure I'm like a broken record to people, but <laughs> people are missing out on yellow babies. There's so much potential there. If people were to focus on, um, you know, I'm talking specifically like Manaquari type yellow babies. Right. Um, if you were to start holding back, and or at least collecting yellow babies that have really nice dorsal patterning um the blue on yellow babies is a little more electric than the red babies it, it's a little more attractive and i think if you were to selectively breed for like really nice wide dorsal banding and and that sort of stuff you can make some killer looking animals and people just aren't focusing on that they're missing out do you think if people prefer to put their eggs over water should have air holes in their egg box I, I honestly can't say. Um, my whole theory on venting the egg box through the whole incubation process is that they're not in a sealed environment when mom's incubating them in the wild. They, they've got lots of airflow. Right. And as long as you're keeping uh, temps good, humidity good, uh, airflow should only be a positive for them. And what I do is I just make sure that if I'm venting those egg boxes, that the eggs are staying hydrated through the whole process. And uh, I, I just want to mention too, while we're on the topic, because I think I heard you talk about this before, where you were suspecting that you were allowing too much temperature fluctuation uh, with your eggs, and that may have contributed to some of the issues that you had. Um, yeah. I keep I keep my, my incubator in the cold part of my basement, because that's the only place I have room. Uh, and in the wintertime, you know, it's like, I don't know, 60 degrees in this part of the basement. 
Mm-hmm. And I'm, you know, I'm when it starts getting close to hatch time, I'm opening that up and checking on them on a fairly regular basis. So I'll get temperature swings uh, all the time. Um, and it doesn't affect them whatsoever. Uh, they can handle small swings. It's just yeah. when something is kept at really low temps or too dry for an extended period of time, that's when you run into problems. See, I had I had way too frequent of swings going on for sure. Yeah. And and mind you, is yours a whole walk in? Like, do you have is yours a walk in? No, no, no. It's just a big. It's a giant igloo cooler. You know. Yeah. Uh, that's just sitting out here in the rest of my basement. See, I I because I had so many times where I was adjusting things in there. And mind you, I had just moved in, so I'm like. I, I should have definitely just kept them in the smaller one, but I, I thought I thought because I had super dwarfs hatching and ball pythons, I'm like, oh, I think this is dialed in. But no, it wasn't. Um, but either way, like, you know, I I have been told by multiple people that fluctuations shouldn't determine if a clutch goes the distance, as long as it's minimal. It's not like yeah. and, and I had crazy spikes, bro. I think like I said before I had the AC uh unit that in here. Before I had yeah, before I had the mini split, this room got to like mid nineties, and I was like, yeah. What? And I couldn't believe it. So yeah, That's I definitely killer. Yeah. Anyways, all right. Moving forward. Here we go. Uh, pre pre first shed meal or post first shed meal? Uh, now I'm doing post. Yay imports or boo imports? Yay. One reptile you would import to your collection anywhere around the world. What would it be? Ooh, uh, croc monitor. <laughs> nice. What about one reptile you could think of that nobody should import? Leave it alone. Don't touch it. Uh, Komodo dragons. <sighs> Respect. Yay sports or boo sports? Mm, yay. Favorite sport? Um, I don't know. Football. Favorite football team? Patriots. Right. What? <laughs> it's all good. Uh, steak or fish? Steak. Yay alcohol or boo alcohol? Boo. <laughs> even even around Bill? <laughs> <laughs> Van Halen or Sammy Hagar? Oh, Van Halen. Yes, I love that. Little word association, first thing to come to mind, milk. Uh, cookies. Stuck shed. Uh, soak. Egg box. Uh, vent it. Favorite locality. Manaquari. Least favorite locality. Um, I'm going to say Biak. Instagram trolls suck <laughs> about this dave if you had to eliminate one and i mean one platform social media platform is it going to be instagram or facebook which one facebook. Else? wow respect yeah gotta say man killer episode i'm not the only one who thought so everyone in the chat thought this was great Thanks, we just man. had we just had shy of 60 people tapped in tonight what do you have to say to all your love and support out there man thank you so much that's awesome I think that's great. I I really appreciate everybody's supported me all this time, you know, with the uh, the specialty enclosure designs and now the reptile perch and, and all that. The community has been super supportive and it's been a blast. I, I can't thank people enough. Yeah, man. Well, I thank you for everything that you're providing to the community, like not only with your productions, but like I said, with the perches and we need more of this stuff. Um, you know, a lot of people who can uh, provide more than just like, you know, you know, don't get me wrong. The breeding side is great. But I mean, we're, we're trying to, you know, build like more of a legacy in this, I feel like. And I feel like this is what you're doing and a huge fan of your work. And again, thank you so much for hanging out with us. But guys, do me a favor. Again, for anyone out there who wants to inquire, Instagram is the best way to reach out, you would say, or what's the best way to email or how would you say is the best way to hit you up? Yeah, you can contact me directly through my website at the reptile perch dot com uh, cool. or you can get me on Instagram or Facebook. I'm, I'm available everywhere. Sweet. All that information in the description below. But it's a wrap for my man, David Brahms of the Reptile Perch. Give it up, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks, man. Hey, real quick. If you had to ask, if you had a question for me to ask Bill Stiegel and Alex Warren this Thursday night in person, what question would you ask him if you were me? When's he going to send me a sickness baby? Wow. There you go. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) Bill, you heard the man. Uh, right. hopefully, hopefully get an answer for you on that. I appreciate it. All right. Yeah. Uh, but listen, Dave, enjoy the rest of your night, man. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks, MJ. Peace out, buddy. Great episode guys. Appreciate everyone who tapped in. Uh, please do me a favor, hit that like button, smash that subscribe button. If this was your first time watching trap talk, Reptile podcast, hit subscribe, hit that notification bell, select all 
and you will not be slept on, okay? Especially if you love learning about reptiles, keeping, how can I get into the breeding side? All this stuff is covered here on this podcast, and I only bring the best in the game. That's a fact. So, again, love you guys. Appreciate all the love and support. Uh, don't forget, tomorrow we're back on the tree monitor side of things. It is tree monitor Tuesdays with, for sure, in my opinion, two of the best tree monitor breeders in the game. Hands down, Canada, United States, on Trap Talk. Tomorrow, we have my man Brandon Van Aston, Canadian cold blood, sitting down with my guy, Brian Susan of Sundown Reptiles. Dude, these guys are fucking killing the tree monitor game, all right? For sure, two of the best. And I'm sitting down with them. Cannot wait. So much to talk about. So much to geek out about. And if you're on that type of level, as far as wanting to learn as much as you can from some of the best in the tree monitor game, then make sure you set your reminder. It's going down tomorrow right here, 6 o'clock Pacific Standard Time. All right? And then, like I just mentioned, Hope you guys are ready to go back to Condro Town because that's where we're headed this Thursday. Condro Town, baby. The mayor, Bill Stiegel, in person. Alex Warren. These two right here. Quite the duo in the Condro game. But we're going to be sitting down with these two this Thursday night. I have a lot to discuss with these two. All right. We have the student and the teacher on the podcast Thursday night. Be ready. It's going down. Coolest reptile podcast in the world. Again, thank you, David Brahms. Thank you to anyone out there showing love to my man, David. Make sure you go support him. Reptile Perch on Instagram. I'll catch you guys here tomorrow, and I'm out.